Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this month's Discover Tennessee History uh, webinar. Uh, we're really excited to have you join us today um, as we close out the series for 2022. Uh, of course, we'll have a couple more for the beginning of next year, but this will be our last one, of course, for this year. So as we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, for those of you participating with us live today, uh, please be sure to keep your mics muted just so we can keep a clean audio for the recording. Um, and we do want these sessions to be interactive. So, uh, you know, be sure that you are using your chat box um, and that we see uh, your first and last name there um, on the uh, on the screen on the Christmas list. Um, again, feel free to ask questions, uh, make comments. We'll be monitoring those uh, throughout the session. Um, with this series, we do have a Padlet page. So again, if you are interested in looking for the resources mentioned today, or if you're interested in finding uh, any of the resources from previous sessions in this series, you can use either the QR code here or use the web address that is there. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to our presenter for this month, and that is Lindsay Kovac with the Tennessee State Library and Archives. So Lindsay, take it away. All right. Hi everyone, I am Lindsay Kovach from the Tennessee State Library and Archives. Um, I have with me my uh, Kelly Wilkerson and she works with the archives as well. Um, today we are going to present uh, trailblazing Tennesseans who are the, um, the people who made um, history in the volunteer state. And let me get where I can share my screen with you. All right, Kara, I'm not seeing the share button. Uh, you should have rights according to- Okay, I see it now. And it's yeah. big and green right in front of my face. Okay, here we go. So, um, we are from the Tennessee State Library and Archives and um, we have a workshop called Trailblazing Tennesseans, the people who made history in the volunteer state, which we'll talk about a little later. But today we're going to just speak about a few individuals who have made history here. Um, we have a new building at TSLA. It is located in the Bicentennial Park um, in Nashville, Tennessee. It is really new, has great displays, virtual um, displays where it's very interactive and you wanna bring your students for field trips. Um, we also have uh, an area for a quiet room, reading room where you can do some research and genealogy history or just research on history topics of Tennessee that you would like. So today, um, we are going to use clues to determine the major players who uh, who trailed a path, or sorry, trailblazed the path in Tennessee. So our first trailblazer, you're gonna get a clue, it's a picture, and if you know it, you can type it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and quickly say it. Um, and then we'll have some clues to go along. So our first clue here is I was born on October 3rd, 18, or 1790 in Northern Alabama. When I was seven years old, I moved with my parents to Chattanooga. Does anyone have a guess with these first clues yet? Okay, I will go to the next slide. Okay, here is a um, man. And I want you to kind of think about this. Um, how old do you think I was? When was this print of me made? And was made from a um, daguerreotype? How old do you think he was? Do you know who he is? 
Lindsay, we're, um, we have a guess at who it is. Um, okay. And I'll, I'll tell that in a minute. But right now we've got James is guessing that the person's early 30s. Um, okay. And our guess at who it is is Sam Houston. Okay, that's a good guess that maybe in his 30s, Sam Houston. Um, it is not Sam Houston. I will go ahead and give you that information. He definitely could be in his 30s. Let's think about another question for him. Looking at this picture, what um, job do you think I had? And folks, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like. We're getting a lot of guesses in the chat. Attorney, lawyer, politician, maybe an officer. Okay, those are all good guesses. And I would say that some of them are leading towards um, the correct what, um, guess of what he might have done. All right. And when you see the next picture, I'm sure some of you are going to know who he is. Who am I? Does anyone know that this man? John Ross. John Ross it is. Definitely it is John Ross. So if you were in our workshop, I would be throwing you some candy right now, but I do not have candy to give to you. Um, but we will go over some more information um, with them. And this is something you could do with your students and play and guess who with these um, historical figures. Okay, his mom and grandmother were both Cherokee. Why do you think that might have been helpful for um, John Ross to have a mother and a grandmother that were Cherokee? Any thoughts? Might be able to speak Cherokee with um, some uh, the Cherokee with some white man, white settlers in um, the town with their government. Okay, yeah. I was able to speak Cher English and Cherokee. What did you say, Kelly? I was gonna say Ginger noted he could speak the language. Okay, good, Ginger. Okay, I helped to write the constitution for the Cherokee nation, which again, his English and Cherokee probably came to help when speaking to both um, the Cherokee Nation and um, Americans. I was elected the chief of Cher the Cherokee in 1828. And in 1835, other Cherokee leaders agreed to sell our land and move west when they signed the Treaty of New Echota. Now, a few minutes, we're going to read a document uh, written by I'm um, John Ross, and it talks about his feelings towards this treaty that was signed. And we're going to like analyze it and um, make some um, comments about this letter and his feelings and thoughts about the situation. So although he protested this deal, the Cherokee were made to give up 7 million acres and their land of their land east of the Mississippi in exchange for $5 million and land in the present day Oklahoma. So what, moving west, what was that called? Um, we've got Ginger saying Trail of Tears. Trail of Tears from James. Awesome, you are right. It was the removal of the Cherokee uh, from their land was called the Trail of Tears. So in our next um, slide, we're gonna look at 
um, a document. And obviously your kids cannot read this document more than likely, your students, because it is in cursive. But we will show you later on during this uh, webinar where you can go to find a transcription of a link where it is all written out in a PDF for you to be able to use um, where it is in print. So this letter was written to Major Irwin and Barron. And I'm just gonna let you read this for a second and think about um, it. And I'm, then we'll go to the next bullet point. So in that highlighted portion, what do you think, how does the Cherokee people and John Ross specifically feel about this treaty? All right, um, Lindsay, we've got one comment saying it is a fraud, don't approve and reject. Yes, it's definitely a fraud. They feel like they were, it was gone behind their backs and it wasn't agreed upon by the Cherokee people and their assembly. Um, so it just feels like they were, it was kind of a backstabbing, if whatnot, um, of a group of leaders within the Cherokee nations. Yeah, we're seeing words like angry show up in the chat. Um, yeah, Kara, I agree with you. I love that use of the word nefarious. <laughs> yes, definitely. He does use some very flowery language here. Okay, um, I'll give you a second to read um, this portion of the letter. So in this excerpt, what is John Ross's feelings here? His thoughts, let not. Hey, Lindsay, so we've got a um, comment that he hopes that higher ups in the US government can be persuaded to get, negotiate a better treaty. He is hopeful and strategic. Yes, he's hopeful, he's strategic. He feels that, they, that the higher ups in the government have been deceived, the Cherokee nation has been deceived. Um, he still feels maybe a tiny bit hopeful that things might change once this letter is um, written. Yeah, he's definitely playing the role of a diplomat here. Um, you know, yes, he definitely is. He's trying to go about it the right way with no violence and he's trying to be peaceful and trying to get the United States to hear what he and the Cherokee nations are wanting. Um, here's another excerpt from this letter and I'll give you a few seconds to read through this um, and I'll ask you a question.
Okay, so what can you tell about uh, John Ross in this excerpt? Lindsay, I'm not seeing any comments yet, but I think, um, you know, one of the things that has always struck me is that, you know, he, he's still hopeful, he's realistic, but still hopeful that maybe something, you know, will turn around. Oh, here's some comments, yay. Um, trying to convince the government that the Trail of Tears won't happen and restating that it's fraudulent and unrighteous. Um, making a last plea to the government to change their minds. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, he's he's pretty much diplomatically pleading, begging for them not to do this to his community, um, the Cherokee Nation. He is like, this is our home. This is where we have built our community, our culture, and they don't want to move. So he is making a last ditch effort here to tell the government that he thinks they're good people and that they will not, the way I read it, they think they're good people and they will not permit this to happen. Okay, so in this slide here, um, we have, a map of the uh, secession of the Cherokee land. And up in the right corner, you will get this slide in a few days um, or tomorrow probably. Um, and you can be, you'll be able to blow up this map. And at the right side, it will show the year and the date the Cherokees uh, seceded that land to the colonies in the United States and what treaty that coincide with. So this is a map that we do have in our archives. Um, so some of these questions I've already asked, but I will um, ask the ones I have not yet. So what did we learn about John Ross in these excerpts? He tried diplomacy. Yeah, diplomacy, he's trying to dipl diplomacy. I look at the large vocabulary, like um, Kara talked about Neferis, like it's very flowery, which shows us that he's well-educated and that he does understand the diplomatic processes that needs to go on but he's also pleading that this was not done um, by the hands of the Cherokee Nation's government. Um, so he's trying to get the United States to understand that. What emotions does John Ross show? Fear. Fear. Frustration. Hope with a mix of desperation that they will lose their homes. Yeah. That's the way I feel. I feel like it's hopeful, but desperation that he does not want this to happen. Um, and you can see how passionate he is about the Cherokee Nation here as well. And how do you think the Cherokee people feel about the treaty? I'm sure some of them feel betrayed. I mean, I always think about that, 
you know, I don't think John Ross shows us that in these letters, but I'm, you know, I'm sure they're feeling that betrayal. Yes, you are right. I, I do think that they are feeling that betrayal. And then anger, frustration, sadness, fear. Yeah. And then I also think about, like, I started thinking about what about this, the sec, the section of the Cherokee who broke off and made this deal. Why do you think they made this deal? And how do you think they felt about it? Betrayal compounded by the fact it was partly done by their own. There's a sense that they didn't improve. Given what happens to the ridges, they definitely felt betrayal. They're forced to do this. Yeah, and I I don't quote me on this. I'd I'd want to go back and check my research on it, but I'm fairly certain the folks who did sign the Treaty of New Echota did not survive. You yeah. know, very long um, past the actual. I think within the next two years, they all died from various, various circumstances. Yeah, Kira, they were for sure. Yeah, I'm sure they, they all were. died. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Do we have any questions about John Ross before we move on to our next person? Okay, here is trailblazer number two. Does anyone have a guess who this man is? All right, if you have a guess, feel free to unmute yourself. We got a couple in the chat. Trista, I'm not sure if I understand what your the 55 means, but she, um, go ahead. She's probably looking at the question I asked, like looking at oh. the picture. What do you think? How old do you think? Oh, yeah, I sorry. Um, we've got a couple of guesses for Polk. Okay, those people who guess Polk, you are correct. Um, looking at this picture, if you didn't know Polk, what do you, would you think? the type of job he had at the time. Attorney. Attorney. What makes us think that he looks like an attorney? The suit and the books. Yeah, the suit and the book. The desk. How he's sitting. Oops. Certainly has a high status. Yeah, he definitely looks like he has a high status. He has that suit and a book at a desk. Like that looks like somebody that's like an attorney or businessman. I even have had people say an accountant as well, um, but definitely somebody in the higher ups of society. So James K. Polk uh, was born in 1795 in North Carolina. In 1806, um, he moved to Columbia, Tennessee with his family. He graduated from the University of North Carolina. Um, he was also a United States House of Representative, a governor of the state of Tennessee. He was a speaker of the house. And even with all those political titles that he has in our country, he is still considered the first dark horse presidential candidate. So, what are your thoughts when you hear the word dark horse? It's not supposed to win. 
not supposed to win, okay? Not a rule follower, that's from the chat. Yeah, so not supposed to win, um, probably somebody who is not a rule follower. Um, Henry, uh, or he was a dark horse candidate in the Democratic Party against Henry Clay, who was in the Whig Party. And the reason why he was a dark horse candidate is because nobody expected him to run or win. Um, he was basically put into that position because he agreed with the annexation of Texas, where Henry Clay and the Whig Party did not want to annex Texas. But he did become the 11th president of the United States. And we already know this is James K. Polk. During his presidency, he had four goals. Um, one was to um, complete the annexation of Texas. Two was to um, start a national treasury. Three, or yeah, I'm sorry, United States banking system. Uh, three uh, was the set the parallel um, uh, at the 94th parallel, I believe, 95th parallel at um, Oregon Territory. And then also, um, and then also uh, the Treaty of um, Growing More Land. So here, the presidential um, inauguration ad address by President James K. Polk um, was on Tuesday, March 4th, 1845. And let's kind of look at what his thoughts were in his address to the country. And I'll give you a few minutes to read this, these excerpts. Okay, so uh, here's some questions about President James Colt, K. Polk um, during his inaugural address. Reading Polk's inaugural address, what areas do you think the United States need to gain during his presidential term? We've got Oregon and Texas mentioned. Okay, Oregon and Texas, yes. Definitely more land. More land. Land beyond um, the um, uh, Rocky Mountains. So basically he believed in manifest destiny, which is what he's known as, is the manifest destiny president. Um, why did the addition to Texas uh, of Texas to the United States cause issue among Americans? And just while I'm waiting for responses, just so you know, James K. Polk did not annex Texas. It was actually Tyler who did that at the very end of his presidency. Um, 
but it was still in the process of being completed when he took over. So um, why do you think this caused issues within Americans? There's several comments related to the expansion of slavery. Yeah, the expansion of slavery. At this time, our country was divided on, you know, we have the Missouri Compromise. So we're not really, we're wanting to keep an even balance of the states and te adding Texas to um, our country at this time is more heavily weighed for slavery than not. And that is not something that Henry Clay really wanted when he was running against Polk. Um, President Polk also added the Oregon Territory after compromising with Britain for the border to be set at the 49th parallel the Oregon Territory became the first, or sorry, became a free state. So once again, we have that balance evened out and the, sh the shift is not uneven at that time. Oops. And then the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago set the Texas-Mexico border to the Rio Grande, at the Rio Grande in Mexico, also agreed to sell uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of, um, oops, sorry guys, and parts of Nevada, Colorado, and Utah for 15 million. So that was a pretty big bargain there. And um, that was a huge expansion for our country. James K. Polk expanded America by 1 million square miles during his four years of presidency. And he did not even run for another term, which is kind of amazing that that kind of happened. Okay. All right, so, whoops, here are some questions about James K. Polk. Was Polk's manifest um, destiny more positive or negative for Americans? Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. It depends on which uh, which Americans you're talking about, you know? Yeah, um, definitely. And that's kind of what I would want students to kind of think about. Like, it depends on what Americans you're talking about. Uh, it's definitely varied. Expansion implies blazing ahead and Native Americans can't be winners in this. Yeah, so... I mean, the Native Americans, like as my next question is, was it positive or negative for the Native Americans? I mean, this is after the Trail of Tears and they've been promised that land in the West. And now once again, what is the United States doing? It's moving the Native Americans again and not satisfying their agreement. Yeah, good. Um, so I guess it's positive in the fact that we have a country now that is from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, but it also increased slavery in this country, and it also did it was harmful to our Native Americans here as well. Um, why would you consider him a Trailblazer. And a trailblazer doesn't always have to be positive or negative, you know? Yeah. People blaze trails. His presidency had a profound impact. 
on the shape of the country, he went after its goal of expansion, all the land he acquired. Yeah, those are all good thoughts. Definitely, he sh shaped the rest of our country, basically, within his presidency. Um, and, you know, he um, maintained his goal throughout that four-year term. Okay, before we move to our next uh, trailblazer, does anyone have any questions about James K. Polk? Okay. Lindsay, are you keeping a watch on time? For about yes, I am. Okay, okay for, Yes, so uh, for the interest of time, I'm probably gonna go a little faster through these. Um, Okay, what are some details you notice about this picture? The instrument, uniform, bugle. Yes. War. Race, war. The details on the uniform. Yeah, that's some nice embroidery there. Very nice embroidery. And what was, what do you think his job was? Musician, military musician. Okay. We're on some good guesses here. Does anyone have a guess of who might this young man be? Okay, what about now? All right, ding, 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 we've got a winner. Woohoo! yay. So we know that this is W.C. Handy, the father of the blues. All right, he was born on November 16th, 1873. I was born in Florence, Alabama, where I began my love for music. I steered away from my family tradition by not becoming a minister like my grandfather and father. Interesting story. He came um, home with an instrument and his grand or his father said, no way, get that out of my house um, because he really wanted uh, W.C. Handy to go through the be a minister just like his ancestors. I was known as the father of the blues. And I moved to Memphis after getting married. There, um, I formed another band and began to play blues on Bill Street. Um, another interesting fact, that first picture you saw, W.C. Handy, he was in a minstrel band in Memphis um, before he got his start. And um, that's the costume that he wore during that time. So he was not in the military, but he's definitely playing in a band. And so after being taken advantage for selling the rights to his first hit, The Memphis Blues, I formed a published company with Harry H. Pace. Okay, I'm going to give you a few seconds to read um, over this, but I'm going to go ahead and put the questions up for the sake of um, time. So you can put into chat what you think um, is going on. And this is a letter written to the uh, Tennessee archivist. And he is wanting to get the blues music to be remembered.
Oops, sorry guys. So what type of career do you think uh, Mr. Handy had other than a composer? Is a publisher. He believed in the power of education to frame a narrative and outlook about U.S. culture. Yes, he he moved his publishing company out of Memphis to New York City, and he made a publishing company. So he was able to publish a lot of different um, artists, especially African Americans, and he was probably more welcomed in New York than in Memphis at this time period too. Um, and yeah, his emotions, he is passionate about the blues. He loves it, but he also wants people to understand that the American music isn't second rate, that it is good. It tells a story and it's the music of Americans, not the music of Europeans. And I feel like students can really grasp this because that's still happening today with songs of their generation. Okay, so we do not have time to listen to him, but we do have his, um, his uh, music sheets the St. Louis Blues, and we have some other ones. And there is a YouTube video, which you will get with the slide presentation. Um, so I do feel free to listen to it and think about what he's saying um, because he does play most of his music. However, there are, most people are singing his lyrics. And in this specific um, YouTube video, Bessie Smith is singing it, which is also one of your Tennessee state standards as well. Okay, so who do you think this lady is? We're big fans of her here at TSLA. And what career? So while you're thinking about this, who do you think she is and what career this do you think she chose to do? So guesses are teacher. Okay, a teacher, yes. Maybe she became an activist for women's rights. Oh, that's something to think about. Okay, so now what do you think she did? And maybe you know who she is at this point. So this lady was born into high society in 1919. Um, her family was very influential in Nashville and expected her to become a debutante. She attended Sarah Lawrence College in New York City, and she enjoyed her time there as a student. After receiving my two-year degree at Sarah Lawrence, I went back to Nashville, Tennessee. That's when she was introduced to flying. After her father's death, I threw myself into flying and on April 27, 1940, I flew solo. I received my license in 1940. So interesting fact about this lady, her father also made all her brothers promise not to fly an airplane, but he never made her promise. Why would you think that would happen? And also, are there any guesses on who this person might be?
We did have a <laughs> guess. I just saw Casey's response. Best Tennessean ever. Yeah, Kira guessed earlier in the chat that it was Cornelia Fort. Okay, she is right. Good job, Kira. So what path did she help to blaze for this period? Well, do we have any answers, Kelly? Well, it, James earlier mentioned, you know, what the impact of women during World War II would have been, um, you know, and how that led to significant change for women's roles um, during the war and then somewhat after. Yes, definitely. Her role changed a lot during um, the, the roles of women. She was kind of a big activist for this during, uh, for her time period. On September 20th in 1941, Cornelia Fort wanted to be part of the war effort. She received a job in Honolulu, Hawaii to teach military men at Fort and, um, Andrews Base. Yet this was not the most interesting part of her story. What was going on in Honolulu, Hawaii around the fall of 1941? Yeah, I think most social studies teachers are going to know the Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl yes. Harbor. Okay, so we don't have, in the interest of time, this is a beautiful article written by Cornoria Fort. Um, it does talk about her experience in um, being up in the air during Pearl Harbor um, and where she had to land her and a trainee down safely um, while she was, uh, Honolulu was being attacked by the Japanese. So um, you will get this article and this uh, slide when you get our Google Drive. Um, uh, in the next couple of days. Okay, and then finally about Cornelia Fort, here is a um, telegram or telegraph uh, from Prentice Cooper, the mayor of Nash Nashville. Um, she was a member of the Civil Air Patrol of, the Na of Nashville before leaning, leaving to join the Ferry Command. She also spoke at a number of war bond rallies, sales rallies throughout the United States, an enthusiastic advocate of women in aviation. And women are needed in aviation and can be an important factor in the national defense program. Women can do um, in this country what we have been doing in England, ferrying planes for factories to airports, flying the, the mail and doing transport work to the government. And these are excerpts from a newspaper article about her death. She did not die in Honolulu. She died in a uh, ferry mission um, over Texas, I believe. And um, a soldier clipped her wing and she went down and was not able to eject. Okay, and our last trailblazer any guesses who she is? Yeah, a lot of folks are getting her right off. This has not awesome. been the case in teacher workshops. The only place that we've been this year where they have immediately guessed who she is has been Clarksville, of course. It is Wilma Rudolph. Yes, it is Wilma Rudolph. And this picture has some significance um, about it. If you notice in the back part of her 
behind her um, in this parade, what do you see and notice about these people? Well, it looks like there are some military men or police officers right here. They're waving. Yeah, I think Laura picked up on it. Well, and, and several others are, are commenting on how it's an integrated audience. It is an integrated audience. And Wilma Rudolph, um, did not, that first they wanted to celebrate her, but they did not want it to be in an integrated event. Um, they wanted it to be segregated and she refused to attend unless everyone could come. So she was a very important trailblazer. In fact, this was the first event that was seg or integrated um, in Tennessee, a parade. So here's some facts about Wilma. When I was a little girl, I contracted many illnesses that left me immobile. She had polio, scarlet fever, pneumonia. She was also told by doctors she may never walk again and they even placed my leg in a brace. Soon, however, by the age of 12, she not only used her leg without a brace, but she could walk and she, even, um, and she was able to run. And when she first got into sports, it was basketball that she loved. And um, Ed Temple, who is a uh, coach, at, who was a coach at um, TSU, Tennessee State University, um, found Wilma and wanted her to run track for him. So she was very young when she began to run. Her first Olympics, I believe she was 16 years old. So why can it be surprising? Because her second Olympics, she won three gold medals and her first one, I believe she won a bronze. So why can it be surprising that she won all of these medals? Lindsay, I think her health situation, so many Olympians, you know, these days we hear that they started training at two years old. So for a woman, it would have had to come along a lot later in her life. Yeah, one, she would have to come up, like make a lot more gains. Um, and practice. Yeah, and then James is mentioning the racism that would have been. Yeah, racism was probably a hurdle that she had to face, was a hurdle. We know when she came back and wanted to be celebrated. Um, and, you know, I think of Wilma as an activist for one, women, two, um, African American women, and three, for people who have disabilities as well, because she did not take one thing the doctors told her and put it as a woe is me kind of thing. She was going to live her life and do the best she could. And I feel like that's a very big statement to the world. Like you really can do stuff to put your, when you put your mind to it. Okay, so the date um, of the earlier picture was October 4th, 1960. Wilma had been looking forward to that day, um, this day, but it did not come without physical and political challenges. And we've discussed the political and physical challenges that she's had. Um, so what do you, why do you think it was important for that to per parade to have happened? in Clarksville.
integration, like, uh, like showing people that all events do not have to be segregated, that people can celebrate and enjoy the same event at the same time in the same place. And that's very important and a very important um, event that took place. Okay, so um, the standards that you uh, cover today are in this um, slide deck here. I did not give them to begin with because you um, might have guessed them through the standards if you're a teacher in here and know those standards by heart. I do need to add um, Polk in there um, and know he is in uh, the high school fourth and fifth, I believe, or yeah, fourth grade standards. Um, so I will get that added to that slide deck. So really quickly, because we are almost out of time, we do have a Docs Box um, program that is on our website. Our website, let's see here. Uh, you are able to book these Docs Boxes. Um, and at an early date, or I'm sorry, at an earlier date when you want to do your uh, the do these activities. Sorry, guys, I am struggling a bit trying to get this quickly done. So here you go to our educators uh, page. You go to education um, outreach. You go to educators, and here you see several different. Um, things that we have available for uh, teachers. And if you go down to Docs Boxes right here, you have um, where you can book these, see what Docs Boxes we have available. You can click on the Docs Box and then come down below, see when it is unavailable, unavailable or available. And then you click here for your Google form print it out, and then it will go to Casey Jimrick in our department um, for it to be sent out for the date. You will have two weeks for that information. And then, <clears throat> we also uh, have a survey, I think that Kira will be um, sending to you as well to get your professional development hours. Yeah, Lindsay, I just dropped that in the chat. Uh, and if, unless you have something else to share, I've got a couple other quick things as we wrap okay. up here. Yes, that is, I'm pretty sure that is it. Unless, Kelly, can you think of anything else? I think we're good. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so as we wrap up here, guys, just a couple quick things. Again, I dropped the link for that survey there uh, in the chat box. Uh, again, a quick reminder, if you are interested uh, in accessing the materials from today's session, as well as previous, be sure to check out the Padlet. Uh, again, you can use the QR code here or the link. Um, Next month, we will return uh, on, again, the second Tuesday of the month with the East Tennessee Historical Society. Um, that session is titled The Power of Place-Based Experiences. Um, and you're know, kind of going along with our, our talking about John Ross earlier, we will be exploring a little bit about the Trail of Tears and teaching Cherokee history. Um, and it will be part of the, uh, the content for that one. So if you're interested in joining us, uh, you can, of course, register for that one. Um, you know, go to the website there with the listings for all of those. And of course, we will have three more sessions uh, coming up uh, in the first part of next year before we wrap the series for the school year. And again, if you're interested in getting PD credit for today's session, uh, complete this survey. Uh, and that works if you are uh, watching the recording as well. Just uh, fill out the survey. We generate those certificates about once a week. So once you've completed it, um, usually towards the end of the week is when I send those out. So just, uh, just be looking for that in your email. Or if you would rather be able to access it via QR code, you can use this QR code to get to that survey form um, as well. And again, we want to thank you guys for joining us for today's session or for watching this recording. Uh, and we hope that you'll be able to join us for a future session. Um, thank you all so much. And thank you everyone for attending.